The man is dead. The director died this morning. Corner. I'll be right there. I know what to do about the files. It is with a profound sense of personal loss that I learned of the death of J. Edgar Hoover. This truly remarkable man has served his country for 48 years under eight presidents as director of the FBI with unparalleled devotion and ability and dedication. For 25 years from the time I came to Washington as a freshman congressman, he's been one of my closest personal friends and advisors. And every American, in my opinion, owes J. Edgar Hoover a great debt for building the FBI into the finest law enforcement You're going to have to move his ass for over 30 the years. You're going to miss I've it. ordered it all the flags. Sure. <clears throat> I'm going to miss having my room searched, my phone tapped. <laughs> Boy, that city will have something on everybody in this town. I wonder what's going to happen to that information now. How many years were you an agent? I quit after almost 20 years. Hoover shipped me out to Detroit because I got hot nuts over a secretary. Can you believe that? You know how Mr. Hoover was about anything sexual. Oh, whatever is in that file, I want to have it. I'm not speaking for myself alone. There are a good many others. All of us are afraid now that what he held may fall into Nixon's hands. I guess Nixon's been wanting to get his hands on the Bureau ever since they turned him down to be an agent years ago. I'll see what I can do, sir. We waited a long time for this to happen, Mr. President. Thanks to Mr. Hoover's files, we're finally going to pay back all those people who've been kicking us around. And I'm particularly interested to see what Hoover had on us. He'll shred them before he lets us get our hands on them. The president has to move in physically and simply take possession of those files. <laughs> For the files, there might never have been a J. Edgar Hoover or an FBI as we know it. Back after World War I, the Bureau of Investigation was the most corrupt branch in the federal government. It was a nest of strike breakers and crooked appointees. Mr. Hoover was just an obscure clerk in the alien registration section who had a fixation about communists and radicals. He started spying on them on his own time. In Czechoslovakia, story del mondo, uniamoci per vincere! Bravo! 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 November 16, 1920, the J.P. Morgan Bank on Wall Street was bombed. 38 were killed. The public demanded something to be done about these radicals, and the only man who knew anything about them was J. Edgar Hoover. He came up with the idea of deporting all aliens who were communists, but he wanted to do it legally. on a boat and take it out to sea and set fire to it. Well, you're Mr. Palmer's man, aren't you? You boys in Washington sure threw us a hot potato. Where are these people being held in from that car? Well, just take a look at them. Half of them can't even talk. We'll be well rid of the lot. Just came from the other houses of detention. Hundreds of persons are being picked up that don't belong to any communist organization. There are people set it up, we're just following out orders. I wrote those orders, there was to be no violence. They resisted arrest and they got what was coming to them. It was your job to make the arrest, not to mete out punishment. You throw a lot of weight around for such a young fellow. Are you familiar with Rule 22 of your immigration regulations? I thought we were supposed to deport them, not kiss their asses. Every one of those aliens has the right to legal counsel for his hearing. I want him given that immediately. You're a real bleeding heart, ain't you? I'd like to make use of your telephone to call Washington. Yeah, go ahead. Ryan, show him where the phone is for all the good it'll do him. Just get out of there, Edgar. Nobody cares about it. We're responsible. I drew up the justification for these raids, but I relied on Rule 22. Rule 22 has been suspended. 
Attorney General Palmer doesn't want these aliens to have lawyers. All these people were picked up illegally. We're kicking them out of the country, aren't we? Let them complain to their friends back in Moscow. Speak English? Anybody speak English? You're stepping on too many toes, young fella. You're finished in the Justice Department. I promise you that. This is it. Father's not here. He's gone to visit my sister in Mobile. Sometimes it gets a bit lonesome. But I see how it could. Would you like to hear a new piano piece? Thank you very much. Come on over and have a seat by me. terribly forward. You're a very pretty girl, and I'm glad you like me. I do. You're so very sweet. Come on, come sit down. I do everything, but I understand. Put you up to this? Oh. Don't look so innocent. Am I being kidding? I mean, why else would a girl want me? A girl like you, unless somebody paid her. I like you, Edgar. Is there a photographer in the hall? Jockey. It's oh. pain. Stop. What are you looking for? Are you crazy? You know there's nothing in there. Mr. Hoover. Mr. Attorney General. 
So, you're the young man that we have to thank for the Palmer raid. Unfortunately, I drafted those legal briefs that were responsible for the arrest. You're aware that I was an outspoken opponent of those raids. And you defended the conscientious objectors during the war, yes? Yes. Rather an odd choice for an attorney general, but I imagine President Coolidge had his reasons. Won't you sit down? I expected this to be a very brief meeting, sir. You thought I'd be asking for your resignation. The Bureau of Investigation's director, Mr. Burns, was fired this morning. I suppose this Teapot Dome scandal means the end of the Bureau. On the contrary. See, I waited for over a month. The problem was that we had to get a successor who I could trust. I have decided, young man, that I want you to become the acting director of the Bureau of Investigation. Say, by the way, how old are you? 29. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the Boy Scout. <laughs> well, what do you say? Do you want the job or don't you? I'll accept the job, Mr. Stone, under certain conditions. What conditions? Appointments to the Bureau are to be based upon merit only. Promotions will be given with proven ability, and the Bureau will be responsible only to the Attorney General. Well, that's an innovation. But it's the only way I give it to you. Well, now you can go to work. No, sir, I want it in writing. In writing? I want the Bureau staffed with lawyers and accountants, the highest caliber of men. Is there anything else? No, sir. Not for now. My father was in the Bureau of Investigation under Burns, attached to the Oklahoma City field office. When Mr. Hoover took over, he summoned many of the agents to Washington to meet with him. Among them, my father and another young agent named Melvin Purvis. We're no longer going to be known as the Bureau of Easy Virtue. Tapping of telephones will be forbidden. I want investigators, not eavesdroppers. Drinking, non-payment of debts, easy sexual practices will lead to summary dismissal. Pretty impressive, huh? It's just a clerk. One of those night school lawyers who joined justice to beat the draft. I, um, hi, Bob. I understand he wants to start a crime laboratory and put in a national fingerprint file. Now, those aren't bad ideas. Well, I give him six months. Excuse me, sir. Shanahan, Bureau of Investigation. May I have a word with you, please? You guys don't carry any guns, do you? It's become open season on FBI agents. I am sick of the newspapers and pulp magazines glorifying these gunmen, making heroes out of outlaws. It's about time to fight fire with fire. You know something? The press seems to enjoy writing stories about these bank robbers and killers. They're supposed to be colorful. I think it's time we acquired a little color ourselves. Hoover brought in Henry Seidel to create a publicity image for the Bureau. You write a series of articles for American Magazine, hard-hitting, crime-busting stories. That'll excite the reader. Where'd you get that busted nose, Edgar? In a fight? He had a cyst removed from his nose when he was 11. Level compromise. You were hitting the snoot by pitch ball. A few fibs can't hurt. Look, I've never actually arrested anyone. I'm an attorney, not a cop, an administrator. You better start thinking like America's top cop. Top cop? It has a nice ring to it. I have a friend in New York, a popular columnist named Winch, Walter Winchell. I met him. He gave us some good leads in the Lindbergh ransom. He's starting a nationwide radio program shortly. Might be very helpful. Sister and Mrs. United States, hats off to America's top cop, J. Edgar Hoover. Top cop Hoover who wages a never-ending war in all 48 states against that criminal army that threatens each and every man, woman, and child in this great country. When Roosevelt was elected, it seemed like Mr. Hoover, a Republican appointee, would be replaced. Then in Kansas City, police and FBI men were escorting gangster Frank Nash back from Hot Springs, Arkansas, when...
Police Chief Reed, two detectives, and one FBI man were killed. Two other FBI men were wounded. The nation's sympathy went out to the Bureau, and it saved the director's job. Pretty Boy Floyd, Babyface Nelson, Ma Barker, and her son Fred Barker have been cut down in their tracks by your agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Another feather in the cap of Bloodhound John Edgar Hoover. Realize Dick Tracy Hoover, whose very name strikes terror in the hearts of the nation's underworld. Purvis, how is it in Chicago? Record heat wave in the city, 23 deaths. Mr. Dillinger will make it an even 24. Our informant called, Anna Campanis. She says she'll finger Dillinger for us if we drop deportation proceedings against her. They're going to either the Marlboro or the Biograph Theater. Well, what's playing her? You should be there, Edgar. If you were to get away again, Nanny, it might prove embarrassing. For the Bureau. What about our informant, Mrs. Campanis? Keep her from talking to the press and the porter. Yes, sir. There is no romance in a dead rat. After that, Hoover always had a kind of obsession about Dillinger. He kept his death mask in his outer office like a hunting trophy. But he couldn't stand it that he hadn't shot Dillinger personally. Purvis. Particularly when Purvis began getting his name in the newspapers. How do you do, Mr. Hoover? Get in. See you and the press have become fast friends? You don't have to worry about me anymore, Mr. Hoover. I'm resigning. I'm going on the radio for Post Toasties. I always kind of like Post Toasties. You ought to try the radio, Mr. Hoover. I bet you sell a lot of breakfast cereal. I've been reading a good deal of your publicity, and I don't believe anybody is doing more injury to honest law enforcement in this country than you are with your publicity-seeking feats. A detective who advertises his exploits every opportunity he gets, who spends the public money to get his name spread all over the pages of newspapers in flaming headlines. Senator. How many actual men have you arrested in your career? <clears throat> My duties here in Washington keep me out of the field. You mean America's top cop hasn't even made one arrest in his entire career? I've got to make a goddamn arrest. And no small fish, it has to look good. This son of a bitch Purvis is making a celebrity out of himself while I'm supposed to be a desk jockey. How about Alvin Creepy Carpus? 
That big enough? Carpus was the last surviving member of the Ma Barker gang. Mr. Hoover wanted to arrest him single-handed, but everybody else got to the act. Let's go. Cuffs. Handcuffs. Well, who's got the cuffs? Shit. S sorry, Mr. Hoover. What about this? Tie his hands with that. <laughs> you boys are pretty nervous, huh? Probably worried about you. Hey, where you going? Why? Because if it's the federal post office building you're looking for, you're driving in the wrong direction. Are you lost, young man? Yes, sir. Don't worry, I can tell you where to go. I was planning to rob it. Now, when you get to the next corner, take a left. Before my next arrest, I promise you I'll bring my own handcuffs and a road map. Mr. Hoover. Thank you, Mr. Before Hoover. any more photographs are taken, you get a tie on. Purvis's notoriety faded. He opened up his own detective agency, but Hoover saw to it that Purvis didn't keep any important clients. Kind of quietly put him out of business, you see. Ruined him. And finally, Purvis broke. Hello? You're there, aren't you? You're always there. I know. I hear the click. I always hear the click. I've got a message for you. I want you to give it to Hoover. Murder Incorporated boss Lepke was the nation's number one fugitive. Hoover warned the underworld that every Italian gangster would be fair game for the FBI if he didn't get Lepke. The syndicate itself ordered Lepke to surrender to Hoover. Hello, Edgar, we've been waiting for you. Uh, it's Mr. Hoover. Edgar, meet Louis Buckhalter Lepke. My pleasure, Mr. Hoover. Want to go through the pockets now? No need to search him. He's not armed. Uh, would you wait in the front seat of my car, Mr. Lepke? You bet, Walter. Anything you say. Don't worry, Edgar. You'll get all the credit. Single-handed, America's top cop. But don't forget the deal. You're going to take him as a federal prisoner, so he won't have to be handed over to New York State to face the chair. His ass is going to burn in Sing Sing. Edgar, you are one son of a bitch. That's when the books and the movies started. It was all strictly controlled. Nothing critical was ever written about the Bureau. The best-selling books that bore Hoover's name were actually written by employees of the Crime Records Division, federal employees on the federal payroll. So Hoover received the author's royalties for work that was done by government employees under government salary. Edgar. You didn't acquire this bird in a pet shop, did you, dear? You're right, Mother. There's a prisoner named Stroud allowed to breed birds in his cell. I paid him $5 for it. Mm -hmm. Well, he belongs in a cell. This particular canary happens to be an artificially colored sparrow. You've been taken advantage of again, son. Gullible. After his mother died, the director was left alone. Well, he had a maid, of course, to look after him, but for all intents and purposes, he lost his best friend. I am not 
criticizing the so-called glamour girl. They're attractive in their way, but they don't seem real or sincere. And they certainly don't live up to my expectations of what a woman should be. I've always held girls and women on a pedestal there. Something to be looked up to, honored, worshipped. Now, if men would remember this and keep them there, a married life would be a lot better. I've had this idea about women all the days of my life. I'd like to know more about this German-American boy. Let's find out whether they're just a bunch of Lindbergh lovers or whether they're actually Nazi agents. Well, that would entail going underground, planting informants, placing wiretaps. I've been against wiretaps ever since I took over the Bureau. Probably unconstitutional. Well, let's not ask Congress anything. I've had enough trouble with them as it is. Well, we're already breaking the law, passing along classified information to British intelligence, so why don't we just go right ahead? We're both going to jail together. All right, Edgar. You've always wanted to play a master spy. Go to it. Mr. President, you wouldn't uh, like to give me that in writing, would you? No, it's not for the record. Just don't get caught. This conversation with Roosevelt was the only authority Mr. Hoover ever had to tap the phones of American citizens, burglarize their homes, and bug their bedrooms. And he kept right on doing it for the next 30 years. <laughs> Ginger Rogers, she's sitting over there. Yeah, I know the lady. I used to take her mother out. So now we know, huh? Oh, it's purely a friendship, that's all. Oh, for a moment there, I thought the boss was slipping. I can't tell you how many times I try to introduce him to a, a couple of very agreeable chorus girls. Take a fling. J. Edgar Hoover won't catch you. <laughs> <laughs> look, I don't fit in. Take a look at this kisser. Did you ever see anybody look more like a cop? Or a hood. All right, I've had enough. You see, Edgar's in a very delicate position. I mean, he keeps himself so busy at that bureau, he hasn't got time to consider marriage. And a man in his position can't very well afford to uh, be caught playing around, huh? But if you don't, they'll get you for that. You know, sort of sly innuendos, limp wrist stuff. That's all, all right. Thing. All right, stop razzing me. I've never seen him walk out this way. I don't think he liked the subject matter very much. Come on, we were just riveting. Yeah, he's right. Look what women have done to us. Taking all our dough, broken our hearts. Maybe, um, maybe Edgar never got started. You don't, uh, you don't suppose... What are you mugs saying? You wouldn't pull the same line of stuff on Cardinal Spellman. He's a priest. What the hell? So is Edgar. And we ordained him. Two minutes before airtime, Mr. President, and Mr. Hoover is in the outer office. I know you're hot under the collar, Edgar. I see I've been preceded by the liberal opposition. I suppose you know Mr. Earl Warren, the Attorney General of California. How are you? All right, Edgar, speak your piece and get it over with. Well, I was wondering if the Japanese are going to get their property back when the war is over. I think our first task is to win the victory, Edgar. It makes about as much sense as rounding up the Italian-Americans. You're the last person I would have expected to object. The only thing I object to is stupidity. Now, they bombed Pearl Harbor. You're letting the Japs in Hawaii go completely free. What the hell are you arresting them in California for? Let's say we're just guaranteeing their safety by putting them where they won't provoke violence. Oh, that's a new twist. Arresting the prospective victim, huh? Edgar realizes that, right, must yield to the necessities of war. Mr. Lincoln was criticized at one time, and I suppose I shall be criticized in my time, too. We're going ahead with this project, Edgar. I trust you understand that. I do now, Mr. President. Oh, and uh, be a good soldier and stand silent. Yes, sir. My father had been transferred to the New York field office. One night, he and my mother were on their way to watch the fight between Joe Lewis and Billy Kahn.
got an ambulance coming. He'll be okay. Mr. Hoover's gonna be embarrassed. A lousy purse snatcher. My kid wants me a G-man. You be one, you be one. That's how my father died. Shot down by a purse snatcher who was never caught. The shape of crime was changing in America. The gangs of bank robbers and kidnappers had given way to organized crime, which was going underground, hiding its operations behind legitimate business fronts. But crime on the streets was beginning to grow. Senseless, violent crime that would someday make people afraid to leave their homes after dark. Just a little bit, getting that arm straight. Let's uh, watch that weak hand so we don't get a hole through it. Give it over. Stroke that trigger twice. Break up that wrist. You satisfied with your position? Holster up. One of the instructors take a look at it. Get the holler. Holster up. Pick up your brass box. Take one step forward. Brass box. A strong foot. On the line. Come to ready gun position. Elbow on the hip. In 1951, after graduating law school at Southern Methodist University, I applied to join the Bureau. It was something I looked forward to all my life. I entered a training program at Quantico, Virginia, and that's where I, I had my first meeting with Mr. Hoover. Good afternoon, Mr. Hoover. Dwight Webb, Quitman, Texas, sir. Webb, Texas, sir. You have a tendency to five o'clock shadow. Shave twice a day. Yes, sir. Orchids to Kami Hunter J. Edgar Hoover, who leads the fight against pinkos and fellow travelers who would hand our nation over to Mr. Joseph Stalin. And, Mr. and Mrs. America, don't ever forget that for every one of those 850,000 Kami Party members, there are 10 Kamis working underground. The gangsters were gone, but now Mr. Hoover had the communist menace to keep the FBI up in the headlines. And he used his stooges in Congress to spread fear a fear that would dictate American foreign policy for the next 20 years. Issued this warning, there were still 11 agents, 10 communists, and 11 sympathizers and 24 suspects on that State Department payroll. And I'll ask you, Senators, how is this possible? Who, who, who was protecting these communists? The big question is where McCarthy got that chart. The suggestion is you've been feeding them confidential FBI files. Well, I wonder where they got that idea. The trouble with you is you don't do your homework. I tell you that there are 23 homosexuals in the State Department. Then you turn around and announce to the whole world it's 40. Mm -hmm. Edgar, I, uh, I need 300 government security risks. I promise to name them. You pulled that figure out of a hat. I couldn't give you three that would stick. They don't have to stick. You can go way back to the 20s for the names. Oh, shut up and then play cards, Joe. I'm generally well liked. People do like me. And I don't understand why they're so down on me now. You accuse a man of 20 years of treason. Then offer to buy him a drink. And you're surprised when he tries to spit in your eye. Edgar, sometimes I have the feeling that you're only using me to get even with Truman because he didn't give you the CIA. Well, if Truman won't let me fight the communist menace overseas, I still have the power to weed out any security risks in his executive branch right here at home. Now, Joe, I'll give you all the information you need, but for Christ's sake, will you please get it right for a change? You know, someday they're going to get us, both of us. You, not me. I'm not gettable. Brunetti's held up in that house across the street, Mr. Hoover. Where's New York's finest? Well, two of the local detectives tracked him down. They're up at the cafe having coffee. That's why I don't allow coffee breaks. 
Let's grab them before they get back. Huh? Well, should I alert the precinct first? Yeah, hell with that. Brunetti belongs to us, not them. But his wife's in there, sir. Well, if they want to share the same fate as Bonnie and Clyde, we'll give them every chance. Come on, Walter, follow me. I don't know what's keeping the boys from the mirror. Well, that's tough luck, Walter. Well, should I clear the area first? Get rid of that red polka dot tie. Only pimps wear those. Yes, sir. Mr. Hoover's going to get somebody killed tonight. Let's let him know we're here. What if he opens fire? Bernetta, this is J. Edgar Hoover. The hell it is! We want you alive. Now come on out or send your wife out. Why don't you come on in and ask that dance, Hoover? Or don't you like girls? Give him the tear gas. <laughs> Another one. Open fire! I'm gonna go in and get her. Who are you? You asshole! You shot my wife! That asshole's Winchell. I'm Hoover. <laughs> Checks so if there's never been a tip, but that's all right, Mr. Hoover. All right, sit down, sit down. Well, that's highly irregular. I don't think I can. Oh, it's all right. Sit down. Frank. Do you know your daughter Joni, the one that goes to City College? Yes, sir. Well, tell her that social club she joined is a communist run organization. I don't want my favorite Raider's daughter on the subversive list. I understand, sir. Oh, yeah, and another thing, uh, your son, the one that got that girl pregnant in, in Jersey, how'd that all come out? You know about that, too? Uh-huh. It's been taken care of. Well, fine, I'm glad to hear it. We checked her out. Oh, she'd been around. You know, a girl tried to trap me once. A girl by the name of Carrie DeWitt. Yeah, she was a beautiful girl. She died in Memphis a week ago. Is your mother still alive? Don't you know Mr. Hoover? My mother's been dead for 17 years. And I miss her. I'm sorry. Do you know Rudyard Kipling? Look, I don't know no Rudyard Kipling, and I don't want to know him. He was a novelist, a poet. Oh. When I was a boy, my mother taught me a verse that he wrote. I memorized it. I used to say it for her, and it pleased her. It pleased her very much. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thought your aim, if you can meet triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same. If you can bear to hear the words you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools or watch the things you gave your life to broken. And stop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to Serve your turn long after they are gone. And so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will that says, hold on. That's very nice, Mr. Hoover. If you could please excuse me. Bring me another one of these, will you? Yes, sir.
bitch. That son of a bitch. I know I cut people up like that. <laughs> The only serious threat to Mr. Hoover's power began with the election of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. No, Bobby, uh, you wouldn't. Besides, uh, McNamara would take a damn view of you looking over his shoulder. The problem is I got myself a cabinet and uh, I don't know anyone in it. Not uh, close. I got the uh, feeling You've discussed it with Dad. Look, um, I'm going to take the rap for civil rights, so I may as well take all the credit. I've got to have you. I need you there more than uh, anywhere else. Well, it's dangerous, Jack. The, uh, there be a lot of people saying I'm not qualified to uh, run the Justice Department, and then it's over. I don't think you can handle them. No one ever has. Mr. Um, um, Hoover is uh, in favor of your appointment. That's a surprise. Why? He was uh, six years younger than you when I uh, took over the Bureau. You both got your start uh, trying to hunt reds, and uh, you made your names uh, trying to nab racketeers. He had his thing about Dillinger. You got your Jimmy Hoffa. Maybe, uh, in fact, you're too much alike. I think Mr. Hoover has me pegged as an easy mark. Bobby, you just have to remind him that you're his boss. All right, now, Mr. Attorney uh, General, let's grab our balls with both hands and go. We'll make the announcement at 2 o'clock. <clears throat> There's uh, going to be a lot of people pissed off at this uh, appointment. What's wrong with uh, giving a kid a little legal experience before he starts practicing law? Yes, Mr. Attorney General. Yes, uh, who is this? This is Mr. Hoover's secretary. Uh-huh. Well, the uh, next time I call on this telephone, I want the uh, director on the other end of the line. So uh, put the uh, telephone on his desk and tell Mr. Hoover I want to see him. What time will you be coming by? Tell uh, Mr. Hoover to uh, come by my office. I'm afraid he's in a meeting, Mr. Kennedy. I said now. It's policy to go to his now office. Well, that uh, policy is being changed as of today. Tell the, uh, director I'm growing impatient. Kennedy's office again. He's still waiting. I'll be in the attorney general's conference room. He'll be right over. Looks like the attorney general has passed the word. What's your name? Collins, sir. Franklin J. Collins. How long have you been with the Bureau? One year, seven months, sir. Send him a copy of Masters of Deceit, transfer him to Knoxville, Tennessee. He'll have plenty of time to improve his mind down there. <laughs> Edgar. 
Mr. Hoover, the Attorney General would like you to join him in Mr. Goldfarb's office. Something urgent? Well, I was uh, looking over the uh, employment uh, statistics, and uh, it's um, surprising how few uh, Negroes are on the payroll in the. Uh... But we have Negroes. No, uh, aside from your uh, five chauffeurs. Well, you know we don't recruit. Well, I think we should uh, be cognizant of the um, outside criticism of the Bureau. Well, very few blacks apply. And very few can pass the exams. Yes, well, I, I think you can manage it uh, in the way that you uh, place some of the uh, few token Jews that you have in visible uh, positions. I know you'll manage this uh, task with all due speed. Mr. Kennedy, we, uh, we hire on merit, not race, creed, or color. And I'll do what I can. Yes, you uh, do what you can, and I'll do what I can. You know what? Uh, Puzzles the uh, hell out of me is that every year uh, the crime rate goes up and you get more money and the bureau gets bigger and uh, the mafia seems to flourish on top of that. That word again. Mafia. It's a myth. A fiction for mystery readers. Oh, is that your um, official position? It, uh, it doesn't exist? There's organized crime, but no national syndicate. Besides, that's a problem for local law enforcement, not us. Oh, yes, that's the uh, story about the 50 men on the case for three years, and he come up with one mob conviction. Yeah, that's bad uh, statistics. You'd have to these 50 men out uh, arresting uh, car thieves and bring them back, and uh, they would look good on your uh, yearly report to Congress. I'm not going to subject my men to that kind of corruption. What are you, uh, what are you saying? I'm, uh, I don't understand. I'm uh, confused. Are you acknowledging the uh, fact now that there is a uh, mafia? Cosa Nostra, or uh, whatever you uh, want to call it. Any investigative agency that ever went after the mob was contaminated by it. There has never been one case of bribery in my bureau, and there never will be as long as I live. Yes, well, I'm uh, sure you do a, a wonderful job protecting the bureau. What I'm worrying about is uh, protecting the public. If you're so hot and bothered about gangsters, why are you doing business with them? What was that? I'm referring to Mr. Giacana. Yes, well, that, um, that matter is, um, solved. It's, um, the president is not seeing Mrs. Campbell at this time, and I, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I for me... I am talking about sharing a bed companion with a gangster, or using the White House phones to receive calls from Mr. Giacana's residence. I've already ironed that out with the president. Did you, uh, personally, uh, tap those phones? What concerns me now is the CIA employing Mr. Giacana for the purpose of assassinating Fidel Castro. I, uh, I don't believe that. Check it out. But I, I will. I don't suppose you'd mind massive wiretap surveillance on the, uh, uh, mafia chiefs, as you call them? No. Prepare the, uh, authorizations. I'll sign them. Fine. Oh, and I, uh, appreciate your, uh, walking to my office. I needed the exercise. Oh. In that case, I'll uh, be sure that I can uh, help you any way I can to uh, fulfill that uh, program of exercise. Ruff? It was a pushover. He was so shaken by the Gia Keller connection that he we went for the wiretaps right away. Well, you always had a weakness for wiretapping. Wait a minute, wait. You know I could smell it? They were drinking beer in there. Yes, Mr. Attorney General. Well, I just want to see if you were there. All right, Williams. This is the FBI. 
Yeah, he's let most of the passengers go. He's keeping 17 hostages. Yes, sir. Uh, right now, I've convinced the hijacker there's a malfunction in the engine. That's fine. I got two guys working on it. Yeah, we'll stall it. Give us time. Well, I don't know how long I can make him believe it. I'm with the director now. The Bureau is not going to lift a hand to help TWA. But, boss, you've forbidden all the Bureau personnel to ever fly TWA. Isn't that enough? The last time we helped TWA with a hijack, the son of a bitch and pilot called Miss Trigger happy. I gave Till and Gas the chance to fire that pilot. I even dug up his service record to prove he was sick in the head. But no, no TWA backed him up. I'll talk to the director. Boss, you know damn well it's our responsibility. Clyde, please don't ruin my day. Just get my agents off the field. That's a... This, but we just got orders to pull out. Must be some mistake. Yeah, the orders are from up top. Just walk away like it isn't even happening. Uh, this is Webb. Uh, you know, there's a wild man in there. He's got a gun and a lot of helpless people. We'd like to go in and take him. Over. Mr. Uber says vacate the field. Move out. OK. <laughs> Wait for me in Mr. Kennedy's office. Listen, I'm on my way to the Attorney General. I'm going to see to it that our agents get those people off that plane. All right, go ahead. This is Mr. McCoy. Countermand all proceeding orders. Go in and get that plane. Mr. McCoy, I'm sorry, but we have orders from the director to vacate the field. Hey, this is Tolson. It's all right. Get those people off the plane. Yes, sir, Mr. Tolson. Right away. I never knew you to go against him before. Oh, Edgar will calm down by morning, I hope. No, he's tired and irrational. His time has passed. He ought to step down before he tears down everything he's built up. <laughs> and who's going to replace him? You? <laughs> Coats. Stay back. Drop the bag. Drop the bag. Listen, Chief, I, I'm just here to fix the hydraulic gear so you can take this plane off, you know? Isn't that the rest of my money? No, I don't know anything about that, Department Chief. I'm just here to fix the plane. Then get off! You hear me? Get off of my plane. Yes, sir. Hear me? Yes, sir. Wait a minute. Come on back. Just you. Come on, come on. Come on, get your hands up. Come For Christ's sake, do Come it says. Keep your hands above your head. See? I'll no kill her. Joe, let's get the hell out of here. Let the fucking police and the FBI handle this mess. Don't move. You're both FBI agents. When we get this plane up in the air, I'm gonna have him. Crash this mother into the White House. <laughs> I'll be a national hero. Take the hundred thousand dollars they gave you. Nobody's stopping you. You're supposed to be ground. <laughs> Chesterfield. You know, Mr. Hoover's regulations, only the boys are allowed to smoke. I'll bring you a carton tonight. About 6 o'clock? I'll make it 8.30 or 9. I've got to put in two hours of free overtime, pick up the statistics. 
How do we know Mr. Hoover isn't listening to us right now? We don't. Mm. He brought Bromus with him again. He wants a Justice Department employee to walk in. Send him a memo that bringing an animal in the building violates Section 201, Chapter 8. What the title... hell does he care about rules? An attorney general who smokes marijuana at parties. Look what's going on at Hickory Hill. The drunken brawls, people getting pushed in the pool with their clothes on, and, and those sex things. He's got a hell of a lot of nerve coming over to your field office on his own. <laughs> He's trying to humiliate you. It's that old Washington gag. You're making it so rough, you'll have to resign. Resign? I cannot wait him. I've outwitted six presidents. <laughs> you know, old Joe Kennedy used to bring little Bobby to see me. He was eight years old. He'd sit on my lap and ask me if I was packing a rod. I was his idol. Yes, Mr. Director. Mr. Tolson. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Freeman. I was up uh, reviewing the uh, field office and meeting all the new faces. If you want any information about my men, please get it from me. Ah. Do you mind uh, walking a few blocks? Not at all. Matter to discuss with you? In the uh, tabs on Bobby Baker case, can I be uh, sure this will come to uh, fruition? I'm going to need written authorization on Mr. Baker. Yes. I'm also going to need it on Martin Luther King. Oh, I see. The, uh, if I don't sign for both of them, I don't get either. Well, they're both equally important. You see Baker as a possible criminal link to Vice President Johnson. I see Dr. King as a possible link to the communists. And I hope we're both wrong. Well, the idea that uh, Dr. King is associated with any fellow travelers is absolutely ridiculous. Oh, Mr. Kennedy. Yes? If you want to go on record saying that Dr. King is the exposed to birth of influences, you go right ahead. You're the Attorney General, not me. No. Continue the uh, surveillance. I'll send the papers to your office for your signature immediately. Yes, you do that. Bobby the baby-faced bastard. What? Bobby the baby-faced bastard. Oh. And that's out of the wiretaps. We're going to put mics in every hotel room that Martin Luther King stays in. We'll get enough dirt on him to expose his entire subversive movement. That bastard's a degenerate, and I'm going to prove it, Clyde. My dear lady, Martin Luther King is the biggest damn liar in the United States. May we quote you on that? I want you to quote me. That's why I said it. Kennedy revoked my White House press credentials. Do you know what that means? Uh, you can see I've got a pretty heavy schedule here. I've got a lot of important people to spy on. You drop back any time, Walter. There's a fly in there. Bring in the fly, Walter. Excuse me, Mr. Hoover. What's the matter? The fly's on your shoulder. Well, hit it. How hard? Hard enough. Some agent wrote this anonymous letter to the Attorney General complaining about Hoover and so I had to check all the typewriters to find out who the troublemaker was. What'll happen to him? I'll give him a letter of censure. Then I'll transfer him to Butte, Montana. <laughs> Lovely. And once he gets settled there and he rents a house and gets his kids into school, they'll transfer him to, to Seattle. You know, they'll bicycle him around until. Resign. Can't you appeal to Mr. Hoover as a human being? Are you kidding? There was this sack they moved out to the brick because he gave Hoover a bad tip on the stock market. Uh, Mr. Hoover don't like nobody but Tolton. Then is it all worth it? 
Well, you're working there, aren't you, lady? I mean, uh, you know, best pay and uh, retirement in the government. I guess I kind of admire the old bastard. Still, you know, reminds me of my father. Too late to get a babysitter? It's raining. We can stay here. I have locks on the doors, and the girls never wake up. Well, I just feel a little bit better. You're such a fool. <laughs> I'm a G-man, you know? <laughs> it comes natural. My dinner. Mr. Attorney General. I uh, dropped by to express my sympathy. I heard somebody stole Mr. Hoover's Christmas tree lights from outside his house. I believe you had an appointment tomorrow well, I, uh, at... I uh, need an appointment. I'm his boss. Is uh, he alone? Yes, but... Uh, Gentlemen? If you would just... Is this a um, habit, regular occurrence in the afternoon? Does he give nap? No, sir. Be a while. If and when the uh, director ever wakes up, tell him I've sent 20 Justice Department lawyers down to Jackson, Mississippi, looking at the voter registration problem. It should take some uh, load off the bureau. He's been working awfully hard. Yes, I'll so inform Mr. Hoover. Yes, do that. And when you inform him, uh, tell him it's the same young Turks that made up my get off a squad. But don't tell him I uh, sat on his table. He might get mad. Yes, sir. Ma'am. What I would like to do is uh, stick a naked lady on the couch next to him and watch his face when he wakes up. <laughs> <laughs> use it. Yes, sir. Webb, I... A tie. I'm pulling you in out of the field and putting you in charge of the techs. Sir, I go crazy sitting out there all night listening to bugs. Whom have I offended, sir? I'm certain that you're aware of how the director frowns on fraternization with female employees of the Bureau, and uh, when it's a married woman with children, it's out of the question. Sir, Janice filed for a divorce before we ever met. The director does not impose limitations on others that he does not place upon himself. I don't believe this came directly from Mr. Hoover. Perhaps that's because you don't know Mr. Hoover. In that case, sir, I request speak to him personally. I'm afraid the director won't be available for several weeks. The racing season is open at Del Mar. Now, I suggest that you consider writing a mea culpa letter of apology. You write that letter, sir. This was all your idea, not Mr. Hoover's. It has come to my attention that you've been operating a Bureau of Vehicle for personal use. Disciplinary action will probably result in three weeks suspension without pay. Yes, sir.
Honey, you can't believe what they're doing to me. Please, Dwight, two special agents visited Charles. Now, whatever they said to him, he took my two daughters out of school this morning. Oh, those sorry bastards. Well, we'll fight them. No. Look, we have fun. We've been friends, OK? Fine. I can't fight. I, I, I don't know how to. I, I just get hurt. Characteristic, hard-hitting style, Edgar. But uh, Dillinger? I mean, aren't you reaching back a little far? Well, nostalgia goes over well at dinner party and aids the digestion. <laughs> hey, my, my deepest sympathy on the passing of the ambassador. He was always a great fan of yours. We had a weakness for the same horse. You're going to stay on here in Georgetown? Well, all my friends are here. Well, if there's anything we can do for you, anything at all, then... I don't think any of my maids are suspected communists, but I do have one unfulfilled desire. So what's that? I've always wanted to go for a ride in one of your bulletproof Cadillacs. Bulletproof? But it doesn't sound any different. <laughs> yes, Florence, you're looking at an old, confirmed lace curtain bachelor. <laughs> Everything they say about me is true. I'm stiff, smug, and very self-satisfied. <laughs> That's natural. A man who spends his entire life prying into other people's private lives should be jealous of his own. But just what is it that you're afraid that we might find out about you? You should be one of my agents. <laughs> you don't allow lady agents. Either you, you have no use for women, or you're very much afraid of them. Lawrence, why are you acting like this? I believe you really like to be Dillinger. Like the good boy who's, who's envious of the bad boy. Only you're afraid to be bad. The Dillingers of this world break all the rules and they're adored. The worse they are, the more fascinating they are. The women worship them. Oh, I've read all the reports about their sexual exploits. And, well, it, it, uh, it did. It disgusts me, that's all. <laughs> you know, you're kind of a funny person, really. Why can't you ever laugh at yourself for being so silly? Then go out and get into some mischief. To tell you the truth, I, I just wouldn't know how. You've peeked through enough keyholes to know the facts of life by now. You're making this very difficult. I know. I'm offering my services to you as a coach. <laughs> Believe it or not, I used to be quite a gay young lassie before I married Wallace. I'm gonna have to go, Florence. Why? Oh, my driver's out in the car. He's waiting. I don't want him to. You mean you'd like to try, but you can't stand your driver knowing. There are no secrets in Washington. Oh, how they look forward to those little sexual tidbits I throw them. I whet their appetite for it. They demean each other, wallow in that filth. I'm pleased to say I'm no part of that. You're a purveyor of it. I understand you distribute obscene material all over Washington. Now I've got to go, Florence.
put me through to White House Extension 163 to Hickory Hill, please. Yes. Uh, this is Edgar Hoover. Yes, Mr. Hoover. I have some very bad news for you. Yes? The president has been shot. Is it serious? I think so. I'm trying to get the details. I'll call you back when I know more. Uh, we have just arrived here at Parkland Hospital. Uh, it's hard to tell what's really going on. Yes. When? He's gone. Get me Hickory Hill again. Why don't you let me call it? No matter what my differences with the Attorney General, it's my duty to inform him. Yes. The President is dead. Now get that goddamn phone back on my secretary's desk. Mr. President, you should get a kick out of this. Some of your staunch congressional opponents of your Vietnam policy compromised by young war protesters, and two of them. Two of them young girls in their early teens. Are you sure you haven't overlooked the amatory adventures of the eager Kennedy boys? Here are the reports. Fully illustrated. Now, how do they get away with that? Oh, nobody prints anything bad about the Kennedys. Oh. I had that kind of charm once. I'm going to miss this bedside reading when you step down. Are you trying to get rid of me, Mr. President? Isn't it about time? You can have any ambassadorship you want. About 70% of my top executives are ready for retirement. Yeah, well, once the ball starts rolling, it won't be the FBI as we know it. No, no. A general opinion says you ought to go. You know, when they took over the Bureau, they called me that Boy Scout. Now they call me that senile old man. Mr. President, I thought you wanted people around you loyal enough to kiss your ass in Macy's window at high noon. Say it smells like a rose? Better to have you on the inside of the tent pissing out than on the outside pissing in. I'll issue a proclamation waiving the mandatory retirement age in your case. You know, Edgar, you're going to be here after we've long gone. Well, I better be. 
Someone has to look after the files. Send Mr. King in. Oh, come in, Mr. King. Well, I see we've been locking horns in the newspapers lately. I'm here to find out why you have been tapping my telephones. But a year ago, you were told some of your advisors had communist connections, but you wouldn't break with them. Would that account for your planting microphones in hotel rooms I occupied during my travels? Oh, we've used the same procedure on 14 others. The Panthers, the Muslims, the Klan. Were you as free with the recording of their private activities? What do you mean, free? I'm led to believe that certain tapes were offered to the newspapers and played for the listening pleasure of politicians friendly to you, and that these same tapes were used by you to stop certain guests from attending my Nobel Prize banquet. I really know nothing about that. I'm sure you're well aware that one of these tapes was mailed to my... Now, Mr. King, I've obtained complete control of all the recordings and transcripts. You can rely on my discretion. Does that mean I don't have to bother committing suicide, like one of your anonymous letters suggested? I know nothing about that either. The damage is done, Mr. Hoover. But it might be worthwhile for the people to know how America's number one blackmailer operates. <laughs> don't give me all the credit. I'd like to take a look at something. The authorizations for the wiretaps. And you'll notice they're signed by the Attorney General of the United States, Robert F. Kennedy. Yeah, they're, they're genuine. There's one covering SCLC headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia, and another one in New York, dated 10-10-63. How did you get him to sign these papers? I only followed orders when Bobby told me to wiretap you, Malcolm X, and other members of your movement. You know you're going to have to take a very firm stand against Bobby on this. Now, who's going to profit, Mr. King? Your political enemies, that's all. The country has survived your being in power over 40 years. Well, I guess we just have to wait a little bit longer. That's right. How much more time have I got? Oh, Mr. King. Mr. King, I've asked some of the newspaper people to wait for in the outer office. I'm sure you'll find something very nice to say about your FBI, won't you? My meeting with Mr. Hoover led to a clearer understanding on both sides. Again, I would like to commend the FBI for solving the murder of the three young civil rights workers. It renews my faith in democracy. Thank you. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and to justice for his fellow human beings. And he died because of that effort. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it is perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are and what direction we want to move in. For those of you who are black, considering the evidence there evidently is that they were white people who were responsible, you can be filled with bitterness, with hatred, and a desire for revenge. We can move in that direction as a country in great polarization, black people among black, white people among white, with hatred toward one another. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and to replace that violence, that strain of bloodshed that is spread across our land with an effort to understand and love. Let us dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Let us dedicate ourselves to that and say a prayer for our country and for our people.
One of those nuns at Pinhead, get rid of him. Still have the touch, boss. I'm announcing today my candidacy for the President of the United States. I run to seek new policies. Policies to end the uh, bloodshed in Vietnam and in our cities. Policies to close the gap that now exists between black and white, between rich and poor, between young and old, in this country and around the rest of the world. I do not lightly uh, dismiss the dangers and difficulties of challenging an incumbent president. But these are not ordinary times. At stake is not simply the leadership of our party or even our country. It is the right to moral leadership of this planet. If I retire before the Democratic Convention, I'll be able to name my own successor. Kennedy wouldn't dare fire a director that's only been in for a couple of months. That way, we'd have our own man on the inside, at least. I can't believe it has to end this way. Well, anyway, now you'll be able to build your own home in La Jolla near the track. Oh, shut up, Junior. They haven't got us out yet. So my thanks to all of you, and it's on to Chicago. Let's win there. I don't care what you say, boss. It doesn't look like real grass to me. Yeah, sure it does. No, that looks like real grass. That looks like fake grass. Why'd you get a new gardener? Oh, he was awful old. I couldn't let him go. Some of the agents came up on their weekend off and laid this down for me on their own time, mind you. They said it looks exactly like grass. Well, the Washington Redskins play on it. Yeah, but this is your lawn, not a football field. Still looks like grass. But look at the weeds growing up in it. Grass. Grass. I'm thinking of doing my whole backyard in this stuff. I can't. Don't you understand? I need an additional source. All right, all right, you do that. Boy, that hits awfully close to home, doesn't yeah, it? That ought to shake them up at 9th and Pennsylvania Avenue. What American bureau chief, a national hero for decades, has been engaged in a lifelong homosexual affair with a key member of his staff? Did I spell Christ homosexual right? Jesus Christ, can you have evidence for this? Oh, Christ, there's been speculation about these guys for the last 20 years. They've always seen together at the racetrack, the ballpark, at lunch, at dinner. Christ, I couldn't spend that much time with my wife. Well, maybe you should have dated Tolson. Two confirmed bachelors, neither one very attractive. What woman would want them? Hoover's married to the FBI. A strange combination of jealousy and devotion. They were at George Washington University at the same time, and they never seen with any girls. Come on, now let's bring it out in the open. And if Hoover wants to deny that he's a fag, why, you'll give him plenty of space, won't you? Huh? <laughs> Did you read that bastard Hindley's column? Yes. Why the hell didn't you say so? I didn't think it worthy of comment. I sent a couple of agents over to Henry's office to tell him to put up or shut up. He couldn't have anything. They'll go on snickering behind our backs like we're a couple of old fairies. It's the old communist smear, but I know it was in back of it. They've been trying to persecute me since the Palmer raids. Let it pass. show his face around here. He hadn't got the nerve. He's got the head of the son of a bitch. He's got the hide of a bull elephant. Hello, Castro. What do you got for me today? I got a surprise for you. Hey, Mr. Tolson. All right, thank you. Bring me a menu. Please, Mr. Sir? Tolson will have his usual. Please, Joe. Bring him a menu. Boss, uh, 
Next month, I don't think I feel up to Miami this year. Now, you decrepit old bastard, you're gonna go if you have to go in a wheelchair. You're all that stands between me and an assassin's bullet. Besides that, I can't pick winners without you. In Mr. Hoover's eyes, the new left was a fifth column directed from Moscow. We'd go to peace demonstrations that take photographs and copy down license numbers, and we'd open dossiers on anybody whose name we could get. When Mr. Hoover went before Congress, we'd get orders to pull out most of our wiretaps so he could testify that they were less than 100 in operation. Then the next day, we'd put all the taps back in again. What are you doing here, Bosto? Inspection tour. Anything cooking? No, no. You know, if we told anybody we spent $87,000 in the past 42 days just to listen in on a couple of crazy niggers, and it's not even admissible because we don't even have a warrant. We asked for a warrant to put a tap on the Carbone family and the courts turned to stop. Now, I know you want to work your way back into the good graces of the director. So you want me to place a suicide tap and take full responsibility in case it's discovered, that right? No, now you know we need more toward electronic surveillance. It uh, keeps the telephone company off our back. And you know it's just as illegal? I don't know what you're worried about. Back in New York, I've been burglarizing the Socialist Workers Party every three weeks for years. Relax. What in the hell ever happened to the Fourth Amendment? Well, Mr. Hoover repealed it years ago. You put one bug into their uh, telephone instrument where it can easily be found, and then uh, you plant a couple of sophisticated microphone devices elsewhere in the house. I wasn't anxious to stick my neck out with suicide tap, but I was glad to see the Bureau was finally taking some action against the mob. I suppose, in the back of my mind, I should have known I was being set up. inside the house right now. You. you set me up. That's what you. Don't you think you're being a little paranoid? Listen, I'm used to this bicycle routine. I lived through a suspension, but you don't like it. So I keep sending letters to Mr. Hoover. That's why. Yes, you make him sound like fucking George Washington. Washington kept slaves and mistresses. Mr. Hoover would have had him transferred. I won't talk to him about this personally, you know? Why don't you kiss his ass and tell him he saved America and you hope he lives forever? I won't tell him how I felt last night running down the street like a common criminal about sending out phony letters on a stolen letterhead, discredit these radical groups about his burglaries, about giving aid to terrorist groups. I won't tell him how I felt breaking the bones of the anti-war movement. Yes, sir, I'm going to talk to him about it. Look, you're coming up for retirement. Now, why don't you just grab it and run? I've given just as much to the Bureau as you or Mr. Hoover, and I think it's about high time he knows what's going on in the field, what's happening to the men and morale, what's happening to the goddamn country, if you want to know, sir. Right. Give my regards to the Wizard of Oz, huh? <laughs> yeah. Mr. Hoover, sir. 
Mr. Hoover? Quiet way up, sir. Why aren't you in Detroit? Sir, I flew down here at my own expense. I've been requesting an opportunity to speak with this you, This is sir. not the time or the place. I don't think you know what's going on, what they're doing to me. This is a breach of discipline. You know that, don't you? Mr. Hoover, sir, we're not only spying on extremists now, sir. We're spying on everyone, newsmen and reporters. And, sir, our agents are being encouraged to entrap these radicals by giving them explosives and guns, even, sir. I know all about you, Webb. You're trying to sabotage the Bureau to satisfy your own paranoid delusion. <laughs> well, they told me you'd say that. I, I wouldn't buy it. Get this man out of here. You don't have to bicycle me around anymore. I'm resigning. And by tomorrow, will you get a letter of dismissal with prejudice? Yeah. Who the hell is winning this race? I don't know. I wasn't looking. What a hypocritical son of a bitch I was. After a career of tapping people's phones and bugging their bedrooms. Well, I just tore up 20 years like a ticket on the wrong horse. What do you look so unhappy about getting the last three winners? I, I, help I, I don't feel good, boss. Really What's the matter, Clyde? It's like I have an indigestion all day, you know? And I have a hard time catching my breath. It's... Let me sit down just a minute. Let's get him back inside. Give us a hand here. Come on, help me, help me. See if we can find a doctor. It's the goddamn Russian Revolution. I was the Attorney General's house back in 1920 when they blew up the place. So seeing kids pee on the lawn isn't gonna raise my blood pressure. I don't feel to see any humor in this situation. President Nixon thinks that all these bombings and riots are the work of the Cuban government, the Egyptians, and the Soviets. The president's called for a meeting of all the national security organizations, CIA, NSA, DIA, and three military counterintelligence agencies, all in the Oval Room. You want me to eavesdrop electronically on anybody you think is a threat to internal security? Read the mail of American citizens, break into the homes of anybody you consider disloyal, and monitor all the activities of student political groups. Is that right? Come on, Edgar. You've been doing this black bag stuff for 25 years now. When did you get religion? It's been 30 years, but never on such a grand scale. And it was always my idea, not the administration's. If you could do it, why can't we all? Because I have no political ambitions. And that's where we differ, gentlemen. Yes, but the nation's never been threatened by so many extremist elements before in its history. We don't want to stop you, Edgar. We just want to get in on it and run it in what we believe to be the best interests of the American way of life. All of the intelligence agencies working together with the president in control. But you're not cooperating, Edgar. You've broken off all direct communication with the CIA. When they had to break into one of the embassies here in Washington, you sent your agents to turn on their sirens and drive off the CIA agents. <laughs> <laughs> you're the old master at this, Edgar. We'll ask you to draw up guidelines along with Mr. Houston. Despite my objections to the lifting of investigative restraint, the FBI is prepared to follow the instructions of the White House at your direction, Mr. President, but in writing. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon, Mr. Hoover. I'll bug and burglarize whoever I please. I'll be damned if I'll let somebody else do it. Oh, you got to watch those guys in the White House. I don't mean just Nixon, all of them. Self-appointed cop for president. That's right, Junior. I'm the only man that ever held a job or ever will. A man doesn't have much in the way of morality unless he's scared of somebody. And I gave him somebody to be scared of. At night, they look under the bed to see if I'm there. They wonder how much I know. It's good. Holds them back. Nixon's frustrated. He's going to do something with you or without you. Whatever we say, whatever we do, the next morning it winds up in the New York Times. How are we going to find the leak? Hoover won't let us polygraph State Department employees. What do you mean he won't let us? Who the hell is he? He has to be told who's president. Yes, but he did implement our request for 17 wiretaps. Only so he could use them against us. 
taps on our own staff and on newsmen. He could blow us out of the water with that. He suckered us into it. You mean it was a trap? Well, we can protect our national security with or without Mr. Hoover. We don't need him or the CIA. We have our own people who can be depended upon. You can be certain of it. They'll be selected carefully. And paid through the committee to re-elect. If Ellsberg can be a hero for bending the law a bit, why shouldn't we? Sooner or later, the old man will hear about it and raise. Holy hell. No, no shit, yes. Now, what can we do about getting those logs back? I have people on the inside, people who know that Hoover can't live much longer. They want to be on the right team when the time comes to pick a new director. Have they access? Opportunity's no problem. The question is, will they have the balls to do it? <laughs> well, there will be a certain perverse satisfaction in being the man who robbed J. Edgar Hoover. How the hell did we get these villains, Edgar? The Rosenbergs, Oppenheimer, Algie Hiss, all of made in the martyrs, and suddenly we are some kind of Gestapo. You remember back when it was good, favorable? How they couldn't get enough of it? It's not the same country. I can get him back. I'm waiting for a, a big break, like the Dillinger case. That'd turn it all around. I know what you're thinking. Nixon's plumbers, goddamned amateurs. And they're getting in deeper every minute. Cubans being paid off, the campaign slush funds laundered through Mexican covers. Oh, I've been careful to keep clear of the whole thing, but I've recorded every detail. I'm just waiting them out. What we don't have is time. Junior, if I can't outlast this shitty administration, I just might take him with me when I go. you were keeping. I felt it was my duty to turn them over to Mr. Marty, the president's request. Look, I'm sorry, Edgar, I just couldn't allow you to use those logs against the White House. How long have we been together? 25, 30 years? 29. 29. Yeah, they're right. I'm getting old and sloppy. It's time for you to step down, Edgar. For your good and the sake of the Bureau. Let go. your heart and nerve and sinew. Serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Get Tedrow and Wilson in here right now. Come in. Yes, Mr. Hoover. I want Assistant Director McCoy's office emptied and locked. He's to have access to none of his papers. He's retiring as of tonight. Now take care of that right now. Yes, sir. You wait. It's been brought to my personal attention that the president's been recording his private conversations on quarter-inch tape. Secret Service is storing them in room 175 and a half of the Executive Office Building. Now, I think we should have access to those tapes in order to duplicate some for, uh, shall we say, historical accuracy? Yes, sir. Oh, 
any tears on Clyde. He's got Hoover's house, half a million dollar estate. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's sweet, isn't it? Mm. Well, Nixon may take over the bureau, but he's not going to get Hoover's PF files because they'll get them at the Washington field office right now being shredded. Well, if you know that, don't you think the White House would know that? Relax. You know how they get inside that building? How are things at the White House, gentlemen? What brings you here, Webb? Probably the same personal files you're after. You have no more connection with the Bureau. Now, you get the hell out of here. Gentlemen, it might interest you to know you're being photographed from across the street and this conversation's being recorded. You're on candid camera, Mr. McCoy. Who put you up to this? The Democratic National Committee. Who else? Jesus. You'll be sorry for this, Webb. I promise you that. Still Hoover's man, huh? I suppose you lost all respect for him. Not all. He hurt a lot of people. But he controlled the politicians, never let the politicians control the Bureau. The Bureau? They'll get their coffee breaks now. The ladies will smoke and wear slacks, and the boys will have mustaches and sideburns. A year from now, there won't be any FBI, the way we know it. Edgar took over after the worst scandal in our history, the Harding mess. He managed to hush everything up for 48 years. And now it's all gonna come tumbling down. FBI, CIA, maybe even the administration itself. He isn't there to cover for them. Manage that dirty linen. Oh, they'll miss him all right.
Within two years of the death of J. Edgar Hoover, the vice president was forced to resign facing criminal indictment. The closest aides to the president of the United States were dismissed and indicted because of alleged illegal activities. Two attorney generals were removed from office and faced criminal conspiracy charges, and the president of the United States resigned his office for the first time in history under the threat of impeachment. The sources of information that brought about this upheaval in government have never been fully disclosed, and some have been heard to speculate that if the hand of J. Edgar Hoover had reached back from beyond the grave, he couldn't have done it any better himself.